take your Bibles this evening and I want you to turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Once you find Philippians chapter 2, I want you to find verse number 1. And right before we read the scripture, let me remind you of this. Uh, Many weeks ago, we started talking on Wednesday night about the subject of separation. And tonight will be lesson number 25. And we've talked about this item of separation from many different angles. And tonight, it'll be just a, a little bit different approach to it. So, uh, separation, lesson number 25 tonight, and it's called Separation and Your Mind. Separation and Your Mind. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 1. Would you stand with me real quickly? I'm going to read just a few verses to you here. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse number 1, the Bible says this. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies... Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem of other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I'm going to pray, remember, the topic, separation and your mind. And let's pray. Father, I need your help. My mind is busy, busy. And I pray, God, that now the busyness would stop and that we would zero in on the target, the truth from the Scripture. Tonight, might we become better Christians? Might we learn this topic of separation in the privacy of our mind? Now, Holy Spirit of God, control what's said. Not only what's said, control what's heard. May our perceptions be spiritual. Do a work, please. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to come back to the Scripture in just a minute. I want you to know that your your mind and your brain are not exactly the same thing. Your mind has to do with your thinking processes, and somewhere in there, I think there's some emotion that's mixed in with it. But I am going to tell you a couple things about your brain, that organ that's inside your cranium. Well, most of you have one. But let me tell you some things about the brain that might interest you. For instance, an adult brain weighs about three pounds. Did you know that 75% of the brain is made up of water? And some of you are thinking, I think my kid's made up more than 75% water. Uh, Then, the largest brain of any animal is that of the sperm whale. And its brain weighs sometimes in excess of 20 pounds. The human brain will grow three times its size in the first year of life. And then it continues to grow until you're about 18. And then, so you know, it begins to shrink. (laughs) Now, I wish other parts of my body kept shrinking, but the brain begins to shrink. The brain of a human contains approximately 100 billion neutrons. You say, how many is that? I don't know. Get with Brother Young and he could probably explain that to you. Now, information runs between these neutrons in your brain, uh, and, and, and it is for everything that we see, everything that we think, there's, there's a connection. These neutrons move information at different speeds, and the fastest speed for that information to pass between neutrons is about 250 miles an hour. And so that's, that's pretty quick. Now, m- most of you don't think that quick, just so you know. That's just that movement of information. Did you know that the brain doesn't feel pain? It interprets pain, uh, so it doesn't feel pain. The human brain gets smaller as you grow older. Now, don't tell young people that, but it does. I, when I found this fact, I thought it was very interesting. During the mummification process, Egyptians would remove the brain through the nostrils. You say, why? Well, it just seemed like a hole where you could reach in there and grab it and yank it out. But that, 
And they did a little at a time unless you had really big nostrils. <laughs> your brain uses about 20% of the oxygen in the blood in your body. Now, there's a lot of things about the, the brain that are interesting. And, uh, but I have to remind you, your brain and your mind are not the exact same thing. Your brain is an organ. Your mind has to do with the seat of your your decision making and uh, the processes that uh, you go through uh, in your decision making. Now, if you have your Bible open there, I'm going to teach part number one of this lesson tonight. And then in a few weeks, the week after Thanksgiving, we'll, we'll teach part number two. If you've got your Bible open to Philippians chapter 2, I want to point something out to you real quickly. In Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse number 1, I'm going to read it to you again. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, full, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Now I want to stop here. You're going to see that the Lord is talking to some Christians about having uh, some unity and them getting along, people getting along. And it uses the words, it says that ye be like-minded. Then it says having the same love. Then it says being of one accord. Then it says of one mind. And it says let nothing be done through strife. And what it's talking about is God is saying, I would like for you to have unity. I don't want you to live in strife. I think he wants that in our homes. I think he wants that in the church. I think he's saying that, and, and, and notice, it talks about consolation in Christ in verse number one. So that's saved people. Saved people can get along. Saved people can have unity. And, but he keeps using those words, like-minded, same, one accord, one mind, no strife. And then you say, well, preacher, how in the world could we be have no strife. How could we how how could we do that? Well, he tells us all the way down in verse number five. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, let me tell you how you can keep unity in a church. Let me tell you how you can keep unity in a family. Uh, we can't be spending all of our time thinking our way. But we learn to think God's way. There would not be any division between a husband and wife if both of them had the mind of Christ. You say, why? Well, they'd agree. There would be no division in a church if everybody had the mind of Christ. If, if it wasn't you telling me what you think, and if I didn't tell you what I think, but we all were concerned about what God thinks, then suddenly we have, we're like-minded. Uh, we're thinking the same things. We have one accord. We have one mind. You say, well, my house, we have one mind, preacher, and it's mine. That's the wrong one. We're to have one mind. But it's not talking about a husband and wife coming to an agreement and having one mind between the two of them humanly. It's talking about a husband and wife giving up what they think and deciding what God thinks is how they're going to think. Now, that would, that would eliminate chaos in a home, uh, young people, you don't get along with mom and dad. You're a teenager. You're having a hard time getting along with mom and dad. You say, well, mom and dad don't think the way I think. And mom and dad say that teenager, that teenager's not thinking the way we think. Can I tell you something? We're all supposed to think the way God thinks. And you would not have confusion. And you would not have disunity if you would just get the mind of Christ. Now, the mind is amazing. When it's used right, it can do great things for the cause of Christ. But wait a minute, when used wrong, it can do great harm to you. And when the mind is used wrong, it can do harm to the cause of Jesus Christ. What you do with your mind will kind of make or break you in life. Your mind is a vast territory, and God wants that territory to be given to Him. He wants you to surrender your mind to Him. Now, on the other hand... Satan wants to claim all of the territory of your mind that he can possibly claim for himself. Man, you've heard me say this before. Probably the great battlefield is not what's happening on the outside of you. It's what's happening on the inside of you. 
And the great battlefield is not what's happening from your neck down. It's what's happening behind your eyeballs, in your head. And look right this way, quiet and listen right this way. There's a, there's a battle for territory. If something, and so you know, if something is allowed to be in your mind, it most likely will come out sooner or later. You say, well, I've got something in there, and I nurture that something, and, but nobody knows what's in there. Well, you're wrong about that. You know what's in there, and God knows what's in there. And in most cases, the devil's the one that prompted the temptation that caused you to want to put it in there. So he knows it's in there. So when you say, well, nobody knows what's in there, I'm sorry, you're wrong. God knows it's in there. Most everything in your brain, the, the devil, and when I say the devil's the one that prompted the temptation, I'm talking about there's something in your brain. The devil threw it out there in front and watched you stare at it and analyze it. He watched your eyes as you absorbed it. Now he knows what's in your brain. And when you're all alone, you understand when you're all alone, there might not be another human being that can see what you're doing. But God sees what you're doing. And the devil sees what you're doing. And of course you do. So let me warn you, whatever you put in your mind, you might put it in there. And you might keep it at bay and you might harness it, but... Uh, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And may I say on the same parallel, out of the abundance of the mind, the Christian uh, reacts or behaves. Probably what's in there is going to come out. Now, the lesson tonight and part two, which will be in a couple weeks, is this. You, you, you need to have a separated mind. Now, we've taught about separating from the wrong kind of music and we've talked about separating from the wrong kind of entertainments and separating from the wrong kinds of friendships and separating from the wrong kinds of religion and separating from the wrong kinds of clothing we talked about yeah, we talked about separating from uh, nakedness and we've talked about separating in, and uh, from wrong conversations and separation in marriage and separation in dating and even separation in our education but let me tell you something you need to separate in your mind you see, the average teaching on separation is always about the outside and the physical. But I have to tell you something. There's a, there is an inside private separation that needs to take place or the outside physical will not last and is a bit phony because you're a hypocrite in the sense that you're separated on the outside, but you're not on the inside. And when God talks about the, t the subject of separation, He's not just talking about what people see. He's talking about what people are. And not just what they are on the outside, but what they are on the inside. And so, separation and the mind. The Bible mentions many examples of the misuse of the mind or our minds misbehaving. In Romans 8, 6, He talks about being carnally minded. In Daniel 5, verse number 20, it talks about people's minds who were hardened in pride. In Luke 12, 29, he spoke of a doubtful mind. In Romans 1, 28, God speaks of the reprobate mind. In Acts chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, he talks about how people's minds were evil affected. In Philippians chapter 3, verse number 19, he talks about those that mind earthly things. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 2, he speaks of those who are soon shaken in mind. In James 1.8, he talks about the double-minded man being unstable in his ways. See, folks, your mind is one of your great hopes for spiritual success. And if you feel like you are being successful on the outside, but your mind is not what it ought to be on the inside, then your success is it's relatively shallow. You need to get that separation on the inside of you, not just on the outside of you. God's Word is to be a primary influence on our minds. And so, you need to be separated in your mind. Now, if you're a thinking person, you say, well, boy, I, I could tell you some things that are just nasty as all get out, and you don't want those things to be in your mind. And I agree, and we could probably call a list off, and we may before the night's over, but my primary intent 
was not to attack, you know, the pornography and all that this evening. Now, I'll probably get to it just to wake you up here in a few minutes. But I want to talk to you about the importance of separation in the mind. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you a scripture. And the scripture talks about a positive attribute of the mind. And then it would mean that if God wants a, a, a specific attribute to be active in your life, then you need to separate from the things that would keep that attribute or that quality from being strong in your mind or being present in your mind. Because, remember, separation is not just on the outside. It's on the inside. I'll show you what I mean. I think, number one, we should separate from things that will make your mind lazy. Separate from things that make your mind lazy. Follow my logic. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, and the people had a mind to work. A mind to work. And that's a positive. They were doing something for God, and they had a mind to work. It's a story of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem, but the Bible says they had a mind to work. And I just want to say to you, you ought to put things in your mind that will help you to develop that that quality right there. That's a work ethic. That's a desire. That's a drive. That's a purpose in life. But wait, you ought to separate from things that would keep you from having a mind to work. Don't justify laziness. And in this case, even when opposition came, these people had a mind to work. You understand in your mind, you make a decision when it's working time. You're either going to work or you're not. What makes the decision? Is your mind. And you ought to, you, hey, I would separate from the things that will keep you from having a mind to work. That may be people. There are folks in this room, you spend time with people at your job who are lazier an old hound dog, and because they're lazy, you calculate that in your mind, and you've decided you're not as lazy as them, but the problem is you're lazy. In your mind, you're putting things in your mind that you're justifying laziness. Well... I have enough things and people and everything under the sun taking care of me. Why should I try to take care of myself? Because you're supposed to try to make your own way in this life. Uh, and so, I think you and I, because the Bible says there is a mind, there's a mindset, there's something that's in one's mind that causes them to work and to want to work and to uh, like to work and to appreciate work. I say to you, you ought to separate from anything that will make you make your mind to think about laziness. Let me go on. Number two, I think we should separate from things that cause our minds to be uh, disattached uh, from God. Let me explain that. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse number 3, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. The word stayed there has to do, it's, it's like the word anchored. So the Bible says our minds are to be stayed on thee. The thee there is God. So our minds are to be anchored in God. Okay, so your mind should be anchored in God. And I'm suggesting to you that you practice separation in your mind and you separate from anything that would keep your mind from being anchored in God. Separate from anything that would cause you to be disattached from God. You say, well, what, what are those things? I, I think you ought to know what some of those things are. Now you can call the rule about the wrong kind of music and the wrong kind of friends and, and the wrong kind of entertainments and, and whatever it is. You, but don't you let anything keep you from having your mind uh, anchored in Christ. There's some of you, you read books that causes the your anchor in Christ to be loosened. They cause you to doubt the purity of God and doubt 
the existence of God. And I say, you better separate and keep your mind away from anything that will keep you from being anchored in God. And notice, by the way, in this passage it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. In other words, God said, if your mind is truly, deeply, sincerely anchored in God, you will have perfect peace. That's a pretty big promise. So, might I try to analyze that? I think it means that if there is an absence of peace, the anchor needs driven deeper into your faith in God. Because, and remember, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And some of you, you just don't have faith in God, therefore you don't have peace. Your mind is not stayed anchored in God. But separate from anything that keeps your mind from being anchored or stayed on God. You know where that happens. It happens in your mind. You, you, and you, you, you think through your faith in God. You think through your belief in God. You think through your belief in the Word of God. And there are things that challenge that. Uh, one, one of the reasons I, my, my kids didn't go to the public school is I was not going to have some science teacher trying to convince my kids that we evolved from monkeys because that's a lie out of hell. And I wasn't going to have somebody tamper with my children's faith. One of the reasons I put my kids in a Christian school that believed the way I believed doctrinally is because I wasn't going to let some Fruit Loop Christian school teacher that didn't believe right teach my kids against the Bible. I wanted my children's minds to be stayed on God. Anchored in God. Deeply anchored. And anything that shakes that anchor mentally separate from it. So separation is not just on the outside. Separation is on the inside. Separate from things that would cause you not to have a, a mind to work. Separate from things that would keep you from having your mind stayed or anchored in God. Number three, separate from things that cause your mind to be hopeless. Separate from things that cause your mind to be hopeless. Let me read to you from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. I'll start there, and it says this. This I recall to my mind. There's the word that we're interested in. Therefore, have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Notice here, it talks about the mind and having hope. Now, I say to you, separate in your mind, from anything that steals your hope. You say, well, what, 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 what is hope? I think one of the very simplest definitions for hope is this. Hope is the belief there is good yet to come. Hope is the belief that there is good yet to come. Folks, our minds need hope. Our minds need spiritual hope. Uh, you and here's what some of you need to do. I'm going to tell you why. Why some of you uh, you struggle because you let too many things in your mind that create hopelessness. Uh, uh, let me let me illustrate. If you watch the news all day long. Every day, you will become hopeless. So what do I do? Separate your mind from the things that create hopelessness. There's even... Do you know that there are some preachers that all they do is say this? It's terrible. It's terrible. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh, oh. oh. And, and, and all day long, every sermon... And they've got everybody depressed. Everybody's depressed. Uh, 
Now, I, I, there are realities that we all must face, but it is quite clear in the Bible that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you uh, listen, there are some of you, you may listen to preachers that depress you. Because they're morbid about everything, all the time. Okay, okay, I, I, I'll tell you something. I protect my desire for revival in my mind. I don't listen to preachers that say it can't be done. Why? I don't hear that. You say, well, you better face the reality. You go ahead and face the reality all you want and, and, and convince yourself it's okay not to have revival. It's not okay. I'm serious. I don't read books from people that tell you it can't be done. I read books from people that tell you it can't be done. I protect my mind. I, I have to. And listen, there's a hopelessness that is out there. I mean, the devil and on the, the television and on the news, there's so much hopelessness. And folks, if you're not careful, you're going to put all that in your mind. And I'm telling you, you should separate from things that limit the hope that God makes available to you. Don't become a pessimist, but be an optimist for Jesus Christ. If you are, hey, look, if you are, if you're the kind of person that the cup's uh, half empty instead of half full, uh, get another cup. <laughs> Figure something out. Hey, get around somebody that's a half full kind of a person. That's some of you're terrible for each other. Why? You cause people to be hopeless. You, 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 you hey. I'll use a Bible character. You all know. You all heard of Eeyore? <laughs> oh, no. It's another day. I don't feel that way. But I stay away from that. So, the whole lesson is practice separation in your mind. And this is just common. This really, it's just common Christianity. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching it to you from a different perspective. You're, you should have a mind to work. And don't let something in your mind that keeps you from being the kind of worker that you ought to be. And you're to have a mind that is stayed on God. And don't put things in your mind that will cause you not to be anchored in God. And you're, you're to have a mind of hope. The Bible, and the Bible's very clear about that. He said, I have hope in my mind. Stay away from things that will steal your hope. Number four. May I recommend that you separate from things that cause pride in your mind. Pride in your mind. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 20, verse number 19. The Bible says this, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. Hmm. Humility of mind. Now, there is a quality. That's something that's to be present in my mind. It's to be part of my character. It's a part of my, 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 my thinking processes. Now, nobody, nobody gets to see what goes on in my brain, but I ought to be protecting what's going on on the inside of me, just like separation protects what's going on on the outside of me. And I am to be careful to protect the humility that is required of me by God in my mind, which means you want to be careful putting things in your mind that create pride. And pride issues. A humble mind is one that continues to learn. Um, and I, I don't mind people doing this. Uh, and, and people that uh, have earned degrees in life. You, you can go in some places and they're hanging and you get to see them all. There's nobody in here that's probably ever seen one of my degrees. I have five of them. But I don't hang them up. And one of the reasons why is I never want that degree to stop me from learning. I, I, I don't want what was accomplished a long time ago to carry me today. I, I want to keep learning. And what is that? I protect. I want to protect my mind. I don't want my mind. I don't want my mind in pride to be satisfied. And you know, all of us, folks, you, you need to guard yourself that you're not putting things in your mind that make you think uh, that you're something that you're not and that you're somewhere where you're not really at. You had better keep your mind humble. So what is it? 
You've got to practice some separation in your mind. Uh, for instance, some of you need to learn how to handle compliments. Because some of you believe them. I, I'll apologize, but people, when people compliment me, I'll say, praise the Lord, thank you, good. Now, if you want to believe the compliment you gave me, go ahead. That won't destroy me. But if I believe all the compliments given to me, that could destroy me. I appreciate the compliment, but that does not mean I believe the compliment. I may thank you for the compliment, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to let it lodge in my brain. Why? Because I need to separate from things in my mind that would create pride. There's some of you who spend too much time in front of the mirror. And I'm serious. You really think you got it together. That pride will destroy you if you're not careful. Uh, so, separate from things that create, uh, that would minimize your humility of mind. You know, a humble mind realizes all you have came from God. A humble mind thinks that everything that you have learned that's of any value came from God. A humble mind does not get too smart for God's Word. A humble mind. A humble mind, a humble mind hungers and thirsts after righteousness. A humble mind is faithful to church. Why? I gotta learn. I don't know enough. Uh, I, when, uh, I was a president of a Bible college. I was vice president of another Bible college. And I gotta tell you, my take on graduation time. When someone was graduating, and they may come by my office to have a, 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 a final appointment. And those seniors that were graduating in, in a few days that would come by my office and say, this is great. I got it. I'm ready to roll. I'm ready to go out there. I have to tell you, my thought was, you didn't get it. And then I'd have some other graduate come by and say, for the ones I'm scared to death. I am scared to death. I wish I could stay here for another three or four years. Uh, they got it. To me, college does not teach you everything you need to know. It tells you how much you don't know. If I got it. I graduated top of my class. whoop de doo Have you taken a good look around at some of the people in your class? <laughs> And since when was it comparing yourselves among yourselves anyway? The Bible says that's not wise. And, and, and I'm just telling you, a humble mind is still passionate to learn. And a humble mind still needs something and they want something and they've not achieved everything. And I'm, and, and, and I'm not trying to steal from you. If you've accomplished things in your education, good. I'm glad that you have. But just so you know, you've not arrived. We sing the song when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise, but i got news for you. At when we've been there 10 million years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to learn the things of an all-knowing God than when we first begun. You're going to learn and learn and learn and learn. And if you think you're a scholar now, when you get to heaven, you're going to figure out you weren't as bright as what you thought. But you better protect your mind so that your mind is a humble mind and that pride doesn't ruin your mind. And that's something that's done on the inside of you. Did you know that true humility is not necessarily seen on the outside? Now, I think there are evidences of humility on the outside. True humility is inside you. It's inside you. You know, there are people that can act humble on the outside, but be full of arrogance and pride on the inside. Only God knows that. And every once in a while, I think there are people on the outside who are confident but humble on the inside, and they give God credit for everything. Be careful. You don't get to judge the book by its cover. Sometimes you've got to know what's inside the book. But separate from things that will ruin the humility of the mind. So separate from things that would destroy your mind to work. Separate from things that would keep you from being anchored 
in God. Separate from things that cause you to be hopeless. Separate from things that creates pride in your mind. Uh, let me real quickly give you two more. Number five, separate from things that will cause your mind to be unstable. Separate from things that will cause your mind to be unstable. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God said, I want you to have a sound mind. Now, a sound mind is a disciplined mind. It's a solid mind. A sound mind is a mind with clear spiritual judgment. So, let me, let, let me explain then. If you're going to have a sound mind, get away from the things, separate in your mind from the things that, that will take away or will make your mind unstable. Now, I think spiritually, a sound mind is not one that's bitter. I think spiritually, a sound mind is not one that's seeking revenge. I think spiritually, a sound mind is one that knows how to forgive. Those are all spiritual qualities that go along with the sound mind. But may I recommend to you that you separate from things that will cause your mind to be unstable or that will rattle the soundness of your mind. The word sound meaning stable. Strong, and I, I, I have to say, uh, I am delighted when I meet people who know what they believe from the Bible, and they believe right, and you don't have to worry that they're wishy-washy and all over the place and believe one thing today and something different tomorrow. That's not sound. If the Bible says something, the Bible does not change. The Lord said, "I am the Lord; I am I, I change not." There is a soundness that comes when you've got a sound Bible and a sound God, and you just latch on to that, and, and, and you, you become solid. God knows in America we need some solid Christians. There's some of you. You're wishy-washy, and it starts in your mind. It's time for you to become sound. But you're going to have to protect your mind from anything that would challenge, dilute, or weaken that soundness. Which means you, gotta, you can't watch every kook on the television that says something about religion. You can't read every book that's down at the Christian bookstore. You can't listen to every song that just happened to say Jesus in it. All that stuff does not make you sound. You read the things that are right. You listen to the things that are biblically right. And it will make you sound. Okay, so we're talking about separating from the things that will cause your mind to be unstable. And unstable would be the opposite of sound. Let me give you one more and we'll be done. Number six, separate from things that would hinder a Christ-like mind. A Christ-like mind. Philippians chapter 2 verse number 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, there's a movement, and you know, how people use abbreviations and uh, many, many years ago, they started putting out necklaces and, and uh, wristbands and things that say WWJD. That's abbreviation for what would Jesus do? Or what would Jeff do? <laughs> or what would Joe do? Now, you should separate from anything that will keep your mind from being like Christ. You say, well, how do I know what Jesus thinks? That's, that's the mind of God. Do you understand? Some of you have memorized Scripture, which means you memorized a part of God's mind. That is sound. That is stayed. That is predictable. Uh... How do I know what Jesus thinks? You get in the Bible. The Bible is the mind of Christ. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you. Notice the word let. It's something you choose. You choose what's in your mind. I'm saying to you, choose right, separate from wrong in your mind. And for some of you, the outward part of the Christian life is going to come easier when you get the inward part of the Christian life down and separate from wrong in the privacy of your thinking. Now, again, we could call the rule about all the nasty, filthy, and we do, and not afraid to. It may be in the other part of this thing, but I'm here to tell you there are all sorts of fallacies, weaknesses that we can put in our brain that hurt us and hurt our minds. And we should separate from those things. 
And, and let me again, if I may, and in a second, we'll, we'll, we'll have some prayer requests and be gone. The passage of Scripture that I used to introduce the lesson is from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, where it talked about same love, one accord, one mind, and it's talking about people being in unity. When, when the people in the church believe God's way and according to the Bible, they get along better. When everybody wants to think their own way, they don't get along as well. When people in a home, when they'll think God's way, they'll get along better. You see, Dad, the best thing you could do is believe the Bible. Mom, the best thing you could do is believe the Bible. Then the two of you don't have to fuss about what you're going to do. It's already decided. Young people, if you'll believe what the Bible says, and Mom and Dad will believe what the Bible says, you don't have to fuss because you have the same mind. And so you could, we could fix marriages here right in this room tonight. We could fix it if you would just do, if you would think what God wants you to think in your mind and separate from the other stuff. And then we'll toss out the disunity in your marriage and we'll toss out the disunity. You young people that are real upset with mom and dad right now about decisions that they've made. Look, if they made a, if they made a decision that is in agreement with the Bible, they didn't have any choice. They had to make that decision. Why? They're to be in one accord with God. And if you would just think God's way, then you wouldn't have contention anymore. So, we are to separate in our minds. We'll go to part two in a couple of weeks. But I want you to think about it. Somehow, we think that separation is always something that affects the outside. But I think separation is something that we need to practice on the inside. Separate in your mind. And you'll be more successful, if you will. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, you've never been saved, you come. We'll take a Bible and show you how to be born again. But let me say, to those that are born again, You say, well, pastor, I I practice separation and everybody can see it. No, I'm sorry, that is not true. It is not that we get to see all your separation. Because separation is not merely on the outside of you. There's probably more to separation on the inside than there is on the outside. And I hope that some of you have been challenged to clean up the mind. Separate your mind. Keep your mind separated. And if you'll do that, you'll be more successful. Hey, you'll be successful on the inside and the outside.